Coffee Convo, April 23rd. Howdy, Miriam. Bonjour, Evan Burke. How are you? Bonjour. Doing great today. Uh, today is the first day of the NFL draft. Uh, I didn't even know until like earlier this week they were like talking about it. I was like, why is everybody talking about this? So this has really become a cultural event. And now they're shifting this to really a virtual online platform this year for, for obvious reasons. And I was just curious, have you been seeing any other entities kind of uh, at the moment, maybe taking advantage of a virtual format like this? And, and could this be something that could be implemented moving forward once we get past all of this? I don't think I've seen something like as an official event taking place virtually. I think a lot of the sports organization have had um, live webinar and events and online gathering. Uh, if you look at the Women's Sports Foundation is doing this, uh, the, the Olympic Committee, uh, several of the different Olympic committees, uh, but I don't know if I've seen uh, an official sporting event or or a, a recruiting event or anything like that yet. Um, however, I think that's definitely what's going to happen more and more, and we're moving towards that direction for sure, right? Yeah, and I was reading something where, so for this draft, uh, the NFL has certain licensing agreements and they have certain uh, sponsors. And so if you're on the official NFL draft cam, uh, I guess through ABC or ESPN, you can't have something that's not sponsored by the NFL. So you can't wear Beats by Dre because the NFL is sponsored by Bose headphones. And so... I wonder if it could maybe create some unique opportunities in the future where instead of attending the draft, which I know is like a huge status symbol and very cool, I'm sure it's an amazing experience, but that could be something that those athletes could take advantage of right from the start of their NFL career, basically to say, you know, Hey, here's a, here's a stream on Twitch sponsored by vitamin water or something like that. And, and maybe kind of uh, have some opportunities to, to kind of hit the ground running in terms of marketing, uh, just just an idea. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they're going fully virtual this year. Yeah, and I think this is the this is the official transition into the online sport world, not necessarily the esport, but definitely into an online version of the existing sport. How are you going to market? How are you going to connect with your your fan? The engagement it's going to come through things like that, right? In these these online uh, promoting events. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more, and we're going to see more and more of the athletes home, backyards, or wherever they're, they're training and spending that time right now. So for me, this is like the logical uh, transition. I'm curious how, you know, it's, it's something that the professional leagues can organize. Um, I'm curious to see how the universities are going uh, to take that on. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is kind of at a broader issue, but, you know, the NFL is poised to really withstand a lot of what's happening right now. I was reading that they have about 15 to 20 percent of their revenue that comes from people actually attending the games. And compare that to college football, which has, I think, like 85% of the revenue generated from the games. And so the NFL has done a good job of kind of diversifying their revenue stream, whereas college football is in a much more difficult situation where if they are going to have games this year, they're going to lose out on a ton of potential money. Um, and, and so I totally agree with you. I think like something like this is just kind of the beginning. And I think also we're kind of at the beginning of virtual reality becoming more mainstream too. I know this has kind of been, you know, in play for five ish years right now, but I think like as things progress like this, there's going to be more demand to kind of like have the virtual reality experience. And especially in light of all this now, whether that's still exciting if you have half the amount of fans in the um, in the stands, I, I don't quite know yet, but I would imagine that, like you said, this is really just kind of like the beginning of a lot of the push towards, you know, making everything really, really accessible. Um, and obviously this is kind of being forced on us right now. Yeah, it's definitely an accelerated version of that transition into a technology supported type of, of sport industry. Um, yeah. And it's just forcing everybody to get down that path much quicker than they ever thought they would be. 
So as we're talking a little bit about uh, football, um, and I know this is your background, and um, wanted to ask you, you know, we Athletes Soul is an organization that help athletes transition out of sport. Um, you've had a transition out of sport as a coach, and I think coaches go through very similar challenges as the athletes do. Uh, you were on a specific path uh, with specific goals, and then you decided to um, to move away from all of that. And so I'm curious, uh, and I would like for you to share, you know, how did you pivot and how did you redefine yourself and what was that process? This is obviously why I became so, um, you know, really engaged and excited about Athlete Soul when we first met because I went through a very similar transition as I think a lot of athletes do when they leave their sport. And I think it was no different for me or any other coach that is contemplating leaving uh, the coaching world or, or coaching their sport. And I think one of the big things for me was number one, taking that time to really kind of decompress after I left. I left in February 2016 was when I left UCLA and, and kind of ended my career as a football coach. I think I spent the next two weeks catching up on like the first five seasons of Game of Thrones because I had never seen it before. Um, but like this innate nature of I guess my personality of wanting to jump into something new really kind of took over after that that pause. And so I immediately jumped in. I had a business idea where I really wanted to help athletes um, transition from high school to college and, and helping them get scholarships. And so I started my own business and I think that was really important. And I didn't have a ton of success. I had kind of um, some pockets of success, but I think overall it was just really hard to have those conversations with parents and do the selling and do all of the creation that, uh, that it took to, to build that business. And I think that was really important because that led me to kind of getting my first corporate job. I went into sales. I was fortunate to have a really great career coach, uh, recruiter that really helped me through that process and identifying what my traits were and kind of reframing my experience. So instead of saying, oh, I have 12 years of coaching experience and I really don't have anything else, she really helped me identify, you know, really you're selling all the time. You're selling to athletic directors in terms of the recruits that you're bringing in. Mm -hmm. You're selling to other coaches in terms of the plays that you want to run or maybe your ideas in a, in a staff meeting. You're selling motivation uh, to players on a daily basis. You're selling the program to recruits. And so she really helped reframe a lot of those things in my mind. And I ended up not being really successful in that sales job. Uh, and I think that year and a half period of starting my own business, doing the corporate sales thing and not ultimately having a ton of experience was incredibly important for me. And I think it kind of helped me identify the atmospheres and the environments that I didn't want to be a part of and really kind of helped solidify the rest of my path towards going down uh, this speaking, coaching, um, path that that I'm currently on. And really, when I look back, everything that I've ever done has really been about pushing others to achieve greatness and achieve excellence. And, and that's really kind of at the core of me. And I don't think I could have done that without kind of having my failed iteration of my business and without kind of failing in that sales role. It's sort of like a transition period, right? Um, whether you're a coach or an athlete or anybody transitioning is the ability to be um, occupied during that, that first year or two years after you retired from another job. So you've got your hands into something that occupies you, that keeps you focused onto something um, so that you're not lost, uh, but that also provide you with a different experience. And it might not be something that you like, but that's okay. And I think a lot of athletes have gone through routes that they didn't like but that's what they learned. They learned that that's not what they wanted to do, or they learned that's how they failed. Um, we've, we've heard that from so many athletes, right? Uh, especially during our, our interviews and talks. And I think that's a common, a common thing that, that comes back every time is like, take the time to choose some, to, to go into something that you might not like. You have to take that risk, right? 
A hundred percent. And I think that that's really important too. And even as I was interviewing for that sales job and I'll admit it was kind of, it was very lucrative. So I wanted that job for, for that aspect mm -hmm. of it. But I even felt when I was going through it, like, Oh, I don't know if this is like a hundred percent fit for me, but I had a lot of natural skills that lent itself to sales. And I think that even just trying that, uh, knowing kind of the whole time that this isn't like a great fit. I think that was an incredibly positive experience and it's taken a lot of time, <clears throat> excuse me, for me to like reframe that in my own mind. I think initially it was really hard I, in coaching. I had never been fired from a job. I had always kind of taken the next job or gotten promoted and I never had that experience of getting fired. And so I think getting fired from the sales job, was a really humbling experience, but it's amazing how often I go back to the teachings and, and really kind of the things that I was able to learn and experience during that time. It's really important for athletes to understand right out of your retirement or right, right when you get into the job market, it may not be a perfect fit. Those are still great situations for you to dive into. And like you said, see if you like that or not. Sometimes knowing what you don't want is just as important as knowing is what you want. And so I think that really kind of helped me on the path and, and kind of put me uh, to where I am right now. It's never going to be the perfect fit. I mean, this is the exception. Someone who finds the perfect fit straight away is the exception. Uh, the yeah. norm is that you're not going to have a perfect fit on your first job, probably not on your second or third one either. And so you have to try and branch out and do different things and take that risk and the uncertainty that goes with it. And you might fail and you might not. It doesn't matter. I think the most important is to take a step forward and not get stuck on like the past or uh, the reminiscent of something that you had you really have to move forward and take that step in and i think that's a very strong message especially right now most of us are going to fail right now because we're in a difficult market uh times are uncertain the economy is not going well um and so you're going to have to take you're going to have to bet on your future um but you can't have a future if you don't start moving towards that so i think it's a really important message and, and one more thing to add just for the coaches out there, the athletes that are transitioning, um, you know, you kind of have to look at it too. If you're a college gra graduate and you're graduating at 20, 22, 23, you're probably going to have maybe two or three or four jobs in that first kind of five, six years after mm -hmm. college. And it's probably not going to be till your late twenties that you really find either a certain career path or maybe like a certain industry that you're going to really make your home uh, for the foreseeable future. And I think that's important to kind of have in your mind as well, because you're really entering into like a different mindset. Whereas in athletics, particularly people that have had the ability to uh, compete into their mid twenties, maybe early thirties, like you've had incredible success for a long period of time. And a large part of it has been, predicated on your hard work. And I think that was one of the things that really struck me was I was working really, really hard um, in the sales company and it just wasn't clicking for me. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, that can be frustrating in the moment. But I think as I start to like be more removed from that time, I really look back and I'm like, oh, wow, I really learned a ton, even though I wasn't incredibly successful. So I think just kind of understanding that you're probably going to have to do two or three jobs before you actually find one that really is a really good fit for you yeah. is important as well. So this is the new Michael Jordan documentary mm -hmm. that just came out. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you about this is take us back to Lyon, France, 1990s, who is Michael Jordan at that time? Do you know who that is? Or just kind of like, was Michael Jordan an entity for you in France growing up? Or did you really just learn about him kind of like after his career was over? Yes, Michael Jordan was a big thing growing up. Um, and we knew a lot about him. Um, and, and if you talk about the 90s, you know, this is right before the Dream Team in 92. Um, so it wasn't just him. I mean, it was him and Magic and Shake Hill and like the whole, the whole group. So, um, and I think that was a little bit also before the French basketball player were actually playing in the NBA. Uh, the NBA sort of opened up to uh, foreign players later on. 
Um, so we had to know about those guys. Um, and it was a big deal. And obviously, you know, his shoes and, and all the things that he did outside of basketball made him an even bigger uh, deal and impact, on, especially on people like me that were athletes. One of the things that's really fascinating about watching this documentary, and I think athletes will appreciate this, you know, everybody in the media is like, oh, you're going to hate Michael Jordan when you see this. Uh, he, he's getting after teammates. He's getting in fights. And I think, like, one of the things about c competing, especially, like, when you're competing at high levels in high school, college, and, and obviously elite levels in the pros and, and training for the Olympics, like, you're used to that. Like confrontations are not something that is frowned upon. Those actually can be really healthy. And I think a lot of athletes and teams would make the argument that you grow a ton out of those conflict. Yeah, I agree with that. And there's different type of, of uh, conflict and confrontation in sport, right? They're, they're the one that are healthy and help your team move forward. And you have to have that. And they happen on a daily basis. Um, and they keep you accountable as a group. This is how you're going to keep each other accountable. If you know that the person next to you is going to react and, you know, and call you on it when you're doing the wrong thing, this is really important. And then there's also those rivalry, I think, between teams that sort of come as conflict. They're a little bit part of the marketing uh, vibe, but they also push you to do better. Um, and there's a lot of like, you know, two teams or two athletes, you see rivalry over time. That's what make them the best athlete. Um, it's really interesting that those are the comment, uh, but it's also what we hear from former athletes on when they sometimes feel a little bit inadequate in the business world after they retire. Often it's because they're too direct. They're, they're so used to confrontation and conflict that in the workplace, they will share their feedback on anything and everything, and it's not always welcome. You know, a lot of athletes or, or former coaches get directed into sales because they innately have that that fire to, to kind of be competitive no matter what the situation is, whether it's a board game or, or maybe uh, uh, hitting your sales quota. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it just kind of struck me that everybody's making a big deal of it and I'm watching it and I'm like, this is nothing out of the ordinary. It seems mm -hmm. like so. Well, uh, and it's also not for athletes. It's not a reflection of your, your personal value. Um, and I, I think that's when what's important. Conflict or confrontation is a process necessary to progress and get better. And so you remove all personal judgment just to like understand that the person next to you is trying to get you to a certain place. The best coach I ever coached with was Frank Gans. And he used to always tell the SMU football team that when we went into a team meeting room to watch film, that we were going to be attacking problems. And a problem was anything that kept us from performing at our highest level. And we always went back to that. So whenever we were in the film room and there was a problem, Coach Gans would certainly attack that problem. But we always let it be known that the, the problem was not personal, the attack was not personal, and we were all doing it because we wanted to perform at our highest level. And so I think that's really an important piece too, is that like if everybody is bought into that culture, then it really kind of unleashes the power of those conflicts as everybody likes to kind of frame them. Well, thank you so much, Miriam. I'm out of coffee, so I'm gonna go run and get a refill, but this was lovely, and let's do it same time next week. Sounds good, Evan. Thanks.